there are very few risks left in Bitcoin. There's one big one left, and that is government regulation. Government's going in and either trying to shut it down or so. And some of you know, if you've been in the blockchain community, I first bought Bitcoin in 2012, that there was a fear. Remember, Bitcoin went to $1,200 and then it went down below because people were afraid it was going to be shut down. But what happened was we were saved by drug dealers and porn and other things. How? Because basically, yeah, we were saved by this because the dread pirate Roberts and the uh, Silk Road exchange uh, was shut down. The government grabbed all these bitcoins. The government grabbed bitcoins that they just dropped on the market for 48 million and they crashed the price and they did it on purpose. They were trying to impoverish all the people who were doing that. And then Congress was getting revved up and said, oh, we're going to shut down bitcoin. But then they thought, ah, ha, ha, we screwed those guys. And so they forgot about it. And meanwhile, bitcoin has now become pretty much unstoppable. However, governments have now woken up and went, oh my God, this is going to destroy uh, currencies that are from weaker countries, one country after another, and now they want to come back. And so what I'm presenting today on behalf of the community is how you save Bitcoin and cryptocurrency from government regulation. And that is when you're talking to people, stop talking about the price of Bitcoin as the first thing or the only thing you talk about and talk about what great things are going to happen. And I'm going to give you 18 different visionary projects you can talk about, find one of them, become knowledgeable about it, and lead with that. And the last one I'm going to talk about is how to save 500,000 children from starvation. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't think that that's a worthy goal. So, without further ado, so uh, I'm quoted as saying that Bitcoin is not a balloon, it's a pin. And I'm going to show you why that is, because it's not. And, I, and almost all the analogies used to kind of uh, trash Bitcoin... By the way, I hate it when speakers stand in front of the screen when I'm trying to get it, so sorry to do that. But there, especially the tulip bulb craze, I'll talk about in, um, in some le level of depth. Okay, so big thing. Uh, token sales since the second quarter are three times as much as traditional project venture capital. It's exploded in that time. Institutional capital is flowing in. Let me give you a picture from New York City. There was a conference that typically had 300, 400 people a year that took place um, a few weeks ago. And it had 600 spaces. They sold out and they got more space. And then the Wall Street people demanded to come in. It ended up having 1,200 people in it. And all the Wall Street firms were saying, oh, you mean you're getting into cryptocurrency? You're getting in? And they all looked at each other. And their top people, they're called the rainmakers, the ones who are bringing the profit in, went to the heads of the firm and said, if you don't get into cryptocurrency, we're leaving and we're taking all our customers with us. So Wall Street thought that it could ignore it and kill it, but now they know they have to come in. And there's an analogy to what's happened in the market now. It's 1927. So anybody know what year the first patent office was established? As far as I know, it was around 19, uh, 1803 by Thomas Jefferson. And from that time up until 1927, individual inventors got the majority of the patents. But from 1928 on, the majority were to corpor for corporations. So corporations are coming in. But you know what's funny about this whole thing? No matter how much they can buy of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin, I'll, I'll give you the number in a minute, it's about 17 million coins are already out there, and there are only 21 million that can ever be made. If people hodl, people hold on, if they become crypto hodlers, then they, they're all the institutions together can only own 10%. And so 90% will still be the individual investors. So just the goal is buy one whole Bitcoin at least and hold it. So let me ask you a question. Who here owns one Bitcoin or more? Okay, if you don't, sell your house and buy at least one Bitcoin just so that you have that and you know you can have it. Okay, so um, total blockchain funding has now surpassed all crowdfunding. But today, um, Indiegogo, uh, one of the big crowdfunding sites, is now doing ICOs. So we just have that. Kickstarter is going to follow. I'm predicting that. I haven't seen the announcement. I just know it. And also, um, national regulators are starting to react. And some of them, like China and Korea, are starting to crack down, while others, like Gibraltar, which I'll talk about, are embracing it. So, okay, let's see if this works. Yes, here's Bitcoin as of a couple hours ago. Uh, 17,000. Look at that graph. Isn't that fun? It's just basically this is the whole time that people who believed in it were holding and holding and holding. And then it happens here. 
Well, that's the nature of a lot of exponential change. Things double and double and double and double and double, but all of a sudden, you notice, and now there's no reason for this to stop because now everyone knows the math. We're in the world of math, and basically people who are no-holders, no-holders is an insult name like no-brainer for people who don't own at least one Bitcoin. And what it means is that there are the people who are bitter and saying all these things, generally, uh, you know, basically Harvard socialists and stuff and lawyers, um, they were all against it. Now they're just jealous that they don't have it, except for Mr. Einstein. Of course, you have to have a name that be a lawyer with the name of Einstein to really get it, so well done. Well done, you. Um, and there's something I want to go over here, which you may have heard before, but if you haven't heard it, it's very important to know. So as of two months ago, guess how many people owned one or more Bitcoin? How many individual human beings owned one or more Bitcoin? Anyone want to guess? 100,000. That's actually closer than most people. Most people are saying millions of people. It's about 700,000 as of a few months ago. Okay, anyone know how many people own gold? Want to make a guess? One billion. Well, it's the right order of magnitude. It's 250 million. 700,000, 250 million, Bitcoin is the new gold. It actually has many of the same characteristics that you would want. So all it takes is for a few of those gold people to also own Bitcoin, it explodes. Now, here's the number all of you will want to write down. You ready? You will want to write this down. Over the fat past four years, there have been an increase of 1.1% on average in money flowing into Bitcoin. So let's say there was a billion dollars into it, then you added in another, basically, another 10 million, right? That's one, uh, or 11 million. Anyone know what 1.1% increase in money invested in aggregate in Bitcoin did to the price? Did it increase the price 1.1% or more? More. How much more? Anyone want to know? Guess? It's 9%. So 1% increase in money going into Bitcoin increases the price 9% because there's a limited number of coins. That's what makes the price explode because a bigger price doesn't increase demand. I mean, sorry, it does, a bigger price doesn't increase supply. So every nine to 10 minutes, how many Bitcoin are produced? What? 12.5. So it doesn't matter how big the price is, there's still gonna be just 12.5 every 10 minutes. Do you think there's more than 12.5 Bitcoins that are demanded every 10 minutes with all the price going up? Of course there are. And since the majority of these are made in China and they're made with subsidized electricity like zero cost or less than two cents a kilowatt hour, a lot of these people say, well, why should we even sell them? Let's just hold on to them. So the price is going to continue going up. Okay. Now, I want to address the tulip bulb craze because so many talks about it. How many of you have heard Bitcoin is a tulip bulb? How many of you have heard this? And how many... What's that? On yeah, it's on my Facebook. So how many people have ever seen or heard a good response? No? You're going to get one today. I want you to memorize this and just stick it right in their face. Boom! And shut them up forever. So the myth is the tulip bulb craze, in which one tulip bulb could cost as one, night, one nice house on the Herrengacht in Amsterdam indicated madness and there was no lasting value, right? That's the story. That is so historically ignorant, it drives me crazy. In fact, the tulip bulb craze, led by the Dutch, they only had a few million people and only 14 million had enormous lasting value. First, they invented the world's first and still oldest stock exchange. What an incredible advantage to have, be the first people to have a stock exchange. Second, they um, basically, they created, uh, those Dutch went over, remember New York used to be New Amsterdam? They were trading on Buttonwood Street, they created Wall Street. So there's a tremendous amount of lasting value to the whole world. Third, they invented futures and options, including hedging and price stability. So the new futures and options that just happened, this is an echo of the tulip bulb boom. Also, they had the world's largest flower market. It's called the Blumenmarkt. Anyone here gone and visited it, taking a tour? Good for you. Excellent. Well done. What did you see when you went there, John Sutton? That's a bunch of bowls and flowers, probably about half the size of Bucharest. It's enormous. That's an echo of this boom. And if you add up all of the stuff, it's billions of dollars a year in stuff. If you take the current value of all the dollars, this thing has been going on for over 400 years, it comes to trillions of dollars of extra economic activity. And last, Netherlands ranked 135th in the world in land area. 
like it's really, really tiny, is number two in the world for food exports and in agricultural exports, second only to the United States, because they learned the value, the high value of food. So we're all learning. That's the major power of this. It's learning. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, good. So Bitcoin started a new Cambrian explosion. This orange is the value of Bitcoin, and this is all the altcoins that come out of it. Now, the Cambrian explosion is something that happened 580 million years ago. Unicellular life, which had been around for hundreds of millions of years, suddenly discovered multicellularity. So you have two or more cells. Life, it's called, it's a mathematical term, it's called exploring the phase space. And it created all the body plans. Biped, which is two legs, quadruped, four legs, centipede, a hundred legs, millipede, a thousand legs. All these things were invented by life, by DNA, 580 million years ago. And everything since then has been just new brain plants on top of the body plants. So when a phase, place, uh, phase space exploration happens, everything gets invented and there's only tweaks of it afterwards. So everything is happening right now and you're incredibly smart to be in this room and looking at all this exploration. Now, here's one of, an insight that you're going to think, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I promise, the more you look into it, you're going to go, oh my God, this is an unfair advantage to unpacking Bitcoin. DNA is the original blockchain. There are many things in common with the blockchain we all know and love. DNA is the original digital object with persistence across time while keeping a complete record. The blockchain is the second digital object with these properties. It really is of one in a billion years type importance. And it's a long molecule that if you take a pin and you have the tip of the pin, that's about the size of your cell. So in your body you have about 27 trillion cells. A trillion is a thousand billion, a billion is a thousand million, a million is a thousand thousand. And if you took it and you unwind it all the way, it would be basically almost exactly as tall as I am. So it's really wound up very tightly, but it's because it's this giant digital record. It's this distributed ledger technology. And DNA, in its current form, ACTG, has lasted over a billion years. Talk about persistence of a record. And it's a complete record of all transactions, just like the current blockchain. What are transactions in the DNA? It's sexual reproduction, plus random mutation, plus natural selection. We can actually deconstruct the entire whole record of the Cambrian explosion 580 million years ago by looking at fossils and looking at DNA. And speciation, creation of new species, it's happening right now. Forks in the DNA blockchain. There are four forks coming up in the next 30 days in uh, Bitcoin and you know, going off of the original Bitcoin blockchain, making new kinds of species. The average life of a species is 100,000 years, but because life has been around for a while, the 99% of all species that have ever lived are extinct. So it's okay for certain kinds of forks to go nowhere, and it's okay for ICOs not to be successful. It's part of life, and it shouldn't be something like, oh, 19, per, 19 out of 20 ICOs are crap, or they'll go out of business. Yeah, that's how evolution works. Don't be immature about it. It's okay. So since unicellular life still exists, there are species that have been around for over a billion years. Some of these things will persist for a very long time. Have, you, have any of you ever heard this before? Because you've heard this. You've heard this? Really? Because I just wrote it down like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. All right, so cryptocurrencies by market cap. This is today. Market cap of Bitcoin, 279 billion. Ethereum, 70 billion. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, 32. So really, Bitcoin and its species is over 300 billion, Ripple's 21, Litecoin, and so on. Pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? And then you can also toss Bitcoin gold in there. Um, I'm going to fly through these things on Gibraltar, but basically the idea of Gibraltar is that it's creating this really interesting context for the evolution of crypto, and they're talking about three things, consumer protection, protecting reputation, economic benefit. They have their distributed ledger technology. They have all their, their rules. I think Gibraltar is basically... Um, a really great place to do ICO, so that's why my company, Token Communities, is a Gibraltar company. Uh, and now, visionary blockchain projects. I hope that you'll be excited by this. These are ideas that you're welcome to take and do ICOs with. It's my gift to you. Each of these things will make billions of dollars. Each and every one of them will, and some of them will make people hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay, ready? 
So there are first 18, and I'm going to go in, I'm going to deal, I'm going to give you an example of each of the first six, and then I'm going to dive in deeply on uh, one of them, the one about saving 500 million children, uh, five, sorry, 500,000 children, because I think that's the most important. Universal addressable identity. Now, universal addressable identity is worth a lot, because you have this automatic login through Facebook, Facebook is worth like a half a trillion dollars. It's basically worth about as much as cryptocurrency. Google has identity too. Identity is worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's much better on the blockchain than without the blockchain. Governance and voting on the blockchain. Online education with credential and competence checking. 100% green energy by 2030. Radical life extension. Intelligence increase and de-addiction. Yes, there are blockchain companies for each of these. Artificial general intelligence, autonomous robots, drones, self-driving cars, microloans for Africa, that's what I'm going to focus on at the end. The metaverse, metaverse, if you haven't read Snow Crash, I highly recommend you uh, do that. It's basically an online uh, 3D world where you can do everything. And there's a movie coming out next March called Ready, uh, Player, um, Ready Player Go, I think. Ready Player One, yes, thank you. Um, that will be another thing about the metaverse. But the original one is Snow Crash. Open. It's the first, it's the first what? Metaverse Oh, Metaverse Foundation is the first I see on China. Interesting. Okay, cool. Open source medicine. This is a coin, uh, term I coined. There's an article about it um, in 2010 in H Plus Magazine. Portable medical records. Um, consumer to consumer real estate. Tokenization of financial assets. Accelerated liquidity for startups. Totally digital banking. Uh, this is something that my co-author of um, Augmented Life in the Smart Lane, which is an Amazon bestseller in not one but seven different categories last year. This is something that made Brett the number one fintech uh, speaker in the world because he said no checks, no paper, no plastic, no bricks, no mortar, no bankers. It's all going digital. And this is an enormous opportunity. And do you know who just endorsed that yesterday? Anybody know? If you read my Facebook page, you'd know. What's that? Yeah, who said that? Okay, get, get, look, at that, look at who that is. Give him a prize. Yes, you're right. Net, Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, I think of Israel in some cases as a, as a bank with a bomb. So to actually have the head of Israel and the head of a banking family who's such a badass that because he got his, uh, he, he basically got Iran kicked out of SWIFT. I mean, like, that's power. If he's saying the banks are going away, like, take it seriously. It's like the mafia is saying that the triads are going away or something like that. It's crazy. Um, the Great Bazaar. Anyone can buy, sell, or rent from anyone else through their mobile phone. And the vanishing middlemen. Lots and lots of people are middlemen between the end consumer and the original producer. Those are going to go away. Okay, so let's talk about universal addressable identity. Civic is doing this, and Civic can work with governments. It can take things in from biometrics. It can take your heart rate, your fingerprint. What I like about Civic is it has so many different inputs, and it has so many different outputs, but I think of it in biological terms. I think about, I think all the time, one of my filters is, is there a biological analogy? And there is, a semi-permeable membrane. That means a membrane that lets some things through but not others. And the idea that you can have your own identity and only give entities a little bit of data, not all of them. Like Facebook knows too much. I mean, how many of you have gotten an email, right? And then there's a Facebook ad that's different or you talk about something with somebody. I was talking about something, uh, a guy in a coffee shop and I had I'll never met him face to face before. And Facebook is then telling me, oh, you might, people you may know. We had no friends in common. Okay, it's listening through the phone, it's listening through the microphone. I want to take and protect my identity. This is at least $100 billion to the people who get it right. Maybe Vinnie Lingham got it right, maybe he didn't. It's still a big opportunity. Um, second thing is governance and voting on the blockchain. Now, this is something. I want you guys, because you've had a revolution. You had the Ceausescu revolution. You're revolutionaries. You're ass kickers. You are experts at this. So three big revolutionary civil um, separations, one of which happened already, and the other two are still to come. Um, oh, by the way, um, 
check it out. Um, my mother always told me my father was Hungarian, but I learned something from my mother when I told her. She said, finally, you went, you went to Romania. Actually, your father is from Romania. So he's from Cluj in the north. He speaks Hungarian, but I didn't know it. I'm actually a, a second-generation Romanian. And I found out today, my first day in Romania. So my mother's 83, and she's, oh, thank you. <laughs> so if you like me, you can claim me. If you don't like me, you can say, oh, the stupid Americans. <laughs> Okay, so first thing is separation of church and state. Read the Declaration of Independence, 1776. The second thing that's happening is separation of money and state. I mean, do you really want people like Robert Mugabe in charge of your future money? And they call Washington, D.C., um, what is it, Harare on the Potomac. It's basically because of the way that they deal money, like uh, Q, uh, quantitative easing. So separation of money and state, that should be complete by 2020. We should be able to do everything in crypto by then in the majority of countries. That's gonna happen fast. And then the last one is separation of voting and state. Like right now, this guy Roy Moore in Alabama um, is refusing to concede the election because people are, 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 are arguing about it. It's generally known that Al Gore won the 2000 election, but people cheated. I know the people who did the cheating. They were Miami Cubans working for the CIA in 2000. And he lost by 237 votes. I'm sorry, 537 votes that are all faked. So why do you want people in power to do the voting? We should separate that out. So this is actually very useful. This is from the Firon uh, white paper. Uh, designing and deploying a social merit algorithm. They basically look at your personality, look at your reputation, and they let you vote. But if you're a better person or a smarter person or in some way have a better reputation, your vote counts for more. It's weighted voting. I like it. You might not like it, so you should make a different system and do your own system. Also, recallable tokens. If you're not a good person, your tokens can be retrieved. If you're a great person, more tokens can be given to you. So the tokens will flow as you help other people. There's a saying, that um, you can get whatever you want as long as you help enough other people get what they want. And that's what I like about this system of Firon. Okay, so open education with credential and competence checking. So you've heard um, my favorite person, Jason King, talk about Academy. Is Jason here? Are you here? Okay, so Jason was talking about education. Education isn't enough. So I'm an advisor. Uh, you saw my picture up there earlier. So I'm going to repeat my challenge to two of the co-founders of Academy, which is it's not just about education, but what you want is you want to be able to verify that somebody has learned something. So the holy grail here is to allow anyone anywhere with a wireless broadband connection, which will be about 6 billion people by 2020, a prediction I made in the year 2000. It's right on track. Um, to not only learn something, but also be able to score, grade, compare, verify, validate, certify, accredit uh, that person. And this is, you know, this is something that, to work on. Again, it's not there yet. It's still left to do. And education is a multi-trillion dollar a year industry. Just corporate education in the United States is over $700 billion a year. It's an enormous amount of money, and nobody's figured this out. It's one of those things that's very similar to the whole thing that Satoshi Nakamoto, AKA the NSA, figured out, which is solving the Byzantine generals problem. This is like that level of problem. How do you know if somebody knows what they claim to know? It's a math problem, by the way. Okay, and then here, 100% clean energy by 2030. Um, this is something, this is a goal that I created. So this is what I call, uh, sorry, getting a little ahead. This is what I call self-fulfilling prophecy. So I've written over two million words about the future with no mistakes. And the reason I'm, I have earned merit, I've earned credibility by doing that, and so when you do that, you can make a, a prediction. You can't do a lot of them, you can do like one of them. So this is where I'm spending my credibility. I'm trying to get governments to adopt this as a goal, and some, like you're saying 2040, 2045, 2025, whatever. But this is the largest single opportunity related to the blockchain. A hundred trillion dollars to achieve hundred percent clean energy. And the basic thing is very simple. Just pay people for solar energy. Now, there are seven different solar energies. People kind of get too obsessed with one of them. So the book to read here is called Solar Trillions by Tony Siba, uh, who's a good friend of mine. And here's the numbers. In 2014, solar was one percent of all electricity, and it's doubling every two years. Um, by 2016, last year, it was 2%. And this next year, it'll be 4%. And then 8%. That go, if you follow that out, by 2024, it's 32% of electricity. And we will end the use of coal. And by 2026, it'll be 64. We will end the use of natural gas. 
And by 2030, it's 256% of current electrical production, and that will come from solar plus electric cars plus self-driving, because each self-driving car eliminates 15 other cars. It's kind of amazing. And so then we end the use of fossil fuels. Now, what does that mean? It means we shouldn't be building pipelines because they're amortized over more than 13 years. In other words, the payback period is supposed to last more than 13 years. We shouldn't be building refineries. We shouldn't be building even gas stations. Anything that has to be amortized over more than 12 years should no longer be funded, no longer be built. And I have a, a TEDx uh, video if you want to see all the numbers there. Um, OK, great. Radical life extension. I'm friends with people who fully expect to live 400 years. Now, you may think that they're crazy, but you should see what they do, because what they're doing is amazing. I went out to dinner on Monday with someone, a woman who looks super hot, very sexy, very young, and she's over 60, because she has this radical life extension protocol. And she's not some person who's just an airy-fairy dreamer. She got her emergency medical technician license, and she has gone over and seen what people die of. Like, she's seen hundreds of people die in front of her. And here's what she had to say. And I said this to the gentleman who is the ultra marathon. Are you here? The gentleman who ran the ultra marathon around Lake Balaton? Yeah. He left. Okay. He left running. He ran away. <laughs> well, good for him. So what she said is they just stopped being able to breathe. So running is really important if you want to be able to keep breathing. If you can't walk up one flight of steps without stopping to breathe or can't walk two blocks down the city without stopping, you're within three months of dying. So I have a saying. If you always take the stairs, you'll always be able to take the stairs. Whenever you have a choice between stairs or elevator, take the stairs, and that will keep death away. So this company, Days, has a virtual AI doctor that makes Uberization of healthcare, that basically that will bring you on demand what you need to know to extend your life radically. And there's a related thing, which is intelligence increase and de-addiction. You may have heard that half a million people have died in the United States of opioid um, overdose. So if you go into the emergency room of the hospital, they give you uh, opioids. I have a friend named Victoria who is a really sensitive stomach. She's very sensitive. She said, don't give me any painkillers. And I said, well, just a little bit. So she went to the uh, uh, home from the hospital, and she was uh, making a salad. And then she looked around, and there was blood all over her kitchen. She's like, where is this blood coming from? And she looked down, and she had cut off her finger. She cut off her fingertip because they gave her so many drugs that she couldn't feel that she was sawing through the nail on her finger and her blood was spurting out. So America's just drowning in opioids. If you take certain kinds of substance, like ketamine and certain kinds of psilocybin and stuff, or ibogaine or iboga, one time to three times, you can end all your addictions. Food addictions, alcoholism, drug, and so on. And so now, through something called MAPS, which people who are whales, you know, big people in crypto, are funding. So this is a company called Lightstar, and they are working on it. I think that they're going to change the world. So also, this is my last example. And this is uh, African potash. Um, I'm writing this white paper. And I'm, by the way, I'm going to tell you that the whole, this white paper is going to take white papers to a whole new level. It's going to be the first white paper that's publishable as a book on Amazon. It's over 300 pages, and it's a whole book, a radical new look at food security, because I take this very seriously. So basically, you have all these different people. A, um, you have the global market gives a letter of credit for a fertilizer. Uh, the farmer gets an e uh, replacing an e-voucher. You have loans and so on. So let me take you through it real quick. A global tea buyer agrees to buy 15,000 metric tons of free, uh, fair trade tea from Malawi Commodity Exchange. Malawi is a very densely populated country in Africa. It's the poorest country in the world, but it's never had a war. I think these people deserve a break. Um, Commodity Exchange informs a token provider that needs to loan $10 million worth of token to 47,000 farmers in the program. The token provider informs local fertilizer uh, distributor that 20,000 metric tons of fertilizer will be needed. Local fertilizer distributor buys this from the global market under a letter of credit and is paid in tokens by the farmer. Okay? So once the crop of tea is harvested and sold to commodity exchange, fulfilling the smart futures contract, local fertilizer distributor's tokens are redeemed by the commodity exchange for fiat or tokens paid in interest. This is passed on to the global supplier, less the local fertilizer distributor's profit, and the token provider's interest for loaning the tokens in the first place. You can't do this without tokens. It doesn't work with dollars or the local, the Malawi kwacha. Kwacha is the local currency. 
So the Malawi farmers are paying 60 to 100% interest. Is that not crazy? And they can't make it because it makes farming unprofitable. Also, you have to have KYC, know your customer, or know your client. Nobody knows who the farmer is, so you can't do that anyway. In any event, how can the farmers risk growing tea unless they know it can't be sold? So they can't do it in the current model. So how does, this, how does blockchain tokenization help the farmer? And by the way, there's something that Mahatma Gandhi said. He said, before you do something, the next thing, consider the poorest person you know and ask whether your next action will make any difference to that person and then decide whether you do it. So I can actually look at you and say, I really do this. I really think before I do something, is what I'm doing anything that will help the poorest people that I know? So blockchain and tokenization means the global supplier fertilizer knows he's going to get paid once the tea is sold because of these smart contracts. The farmer can wait for payment and it's at a lower rate of interest. It can be 75% off the commercial rate. And that means these guys don't have to work for $2 a week breaking their back for, um, for a tobacco company, which is just going to make them sick anyway because it's toxic. So they have uh, 47,000 people and 500,000 lives. The income there is $250, uh, and they're basically 500,000 children close to starvation. By giving farmers access to these inputs, it's going to change everything. So uh, feel free to friend me on Facebook, um, alexcto4g at gmail.com or alex at tokencommunities.com. Thank you for your time. I hope that you've found this interesting and useful. Alex. Can I say one thing too? Sure, I want sure, to, to say one thing about, about Mike Kustash. Um, one of the, I've known him since early 2000, and one of the things I really like about him is that I think he's a level five leader. Have any of you heard of the level five levels of leadership? The idea of a level five leader is a leader who creates leaders who create leaders. So with, by creating all of these different things, a blockchain investors consortium, he's creating all these opportunities for people to become leaders and then help other people become leaders. And there's no higher and better use of your time than to create a system by which leaders become leaders. So I'd like you to give him a hand for being a, five, a level five leader. So the reason why I gave up on stage is to say the following. Um, you broke uh, many rules in this world, and one of them is that we've never given anyone more than 15 minutes as an individual speaker. Okay. No, 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 no. We, we did agree for you to have 30 minutes, but I just want to make sure you guys understood why he's a genius in my book and why he could have had another 30 minutes and would have kept you captivated in your seats. So I just want to thank you for that, for coming all the way here. It's his birthday. So uh, we're, we're, we're here because I, I hooked him on celebrating his birthday at Dracula's Castle on Saturday. Uh, something I've been telling him since uh, March 2000. <laughs> we met at the Milken uh, Institute Global Conference, which is the second biggest event in the world after the World Economic Forum in Davos. So the, but the, the Milken Institute Global Forum takes uh, forum, uh, the Milken Institute Global Conference takes place in LA for 20 years, and it's uh, the, the brainchild of Mike Milken, one of my mentors and, and, and advisors. And Mike Milken, as you all know, is a, a guy known for the invent he invented the junk bond. Right? When, when nobody would finance 23,000 companies on Wall Street and everybody wanted to finance those 800 companies that were AAA grade, he invented the 16, 17% interest rate, the junk bonds. He did have to go to jail for 20 months. I hope I don't have to go to jail for, for, for being part of this evolution with, with, with Alex and with all the folks out there and Brock Beers and so forth. We hope to create and move this evolution of, of ICOs to the next level. And they, they morph every single day. From ICO to ICO, they morph. But Alex is someone that was watching this quietly. And um, we, we reconnected after a number of years of just watching each other on Facebook and LinkedIn. And he came August uh, 10th with me to San Francisco for the, um, I think it was the eighth uh, global edition of d He gave an amazing speech there. And I said, you have to join the bandwagon with Jason King and Brock and, uh, and Craig Sellers and go all over the world with us. And, and you know, it's interesting that now all of us from LA Right? or at least 20 years of our lives in LA, are now throughout the world touring on stages with mics, promoting not just Bitcoin, but decentralization. And, and this was a phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, so thank you for this presentation. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Great. And I, I, can also, I can also tell you, I never give the same presentation twice. Um, I did this presentation today while I was sitting in the back. <laughs>